The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure on As We See It. This is show number 39. We're almost to 40, being recorded on Sunday, April 22nd, 2012. In Boston, I'm Ed Jupin, and also joining us from the Boston area is the lobster, Larry Marks, out in the Pocono Mountains, Fred Boaz, in St. Louis, Missouri, Holly Hurley, I like the way I'm working my way across country. And out in California, in Southern California, in Los Angeles, we have Gene White. And up in the Bay Area of Northern California, we have BaseNet producer Jessica Moskowitz joining us today. Hello, everybody. Hello, Ed. How you Hi, doing? Hey. Hey. Hello. How you doing? Boy, we have a full house tonight. <laughs> Indeed. Wow, we don't get this many people. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to have to start limiting i think or something i think six <laughs> just is just about it if we had seven we'd be one over the top i think <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to take turns talking so that, that's it yeah well we we are gonna have to be a little careful that we normally step on each other when there's only three of us so I, we're really gonna have to be careful today so i guess we'll jump right into lobster tales for the Woo! week and then uh, we can see what kind of exciting stories we have this week <clears throat> larry Take her away. Okay, here we go. License and registration, please. Oops, sorry, we gotta go. A 20-year-old man impersonated a police officer by putting flashing lights on the roof of his car and pulling over another car in Fort Wayne, Indiana. When the, when the men in the other car turned out to be real police officers, he ran back to his car and drove away. They followed him to a nearby bar where he was arrested. Oops. Number two, is, do any of you guys hear a strange beeping sound? Several men were driving around Renton, Washington, casing cars that they could steal when one of them butt dialed 911. The dispatcher listened for 44 minutes while they hatched their plans. The man made three other accidentally dialed 911 calls that ultimately led to their arrest. And number three is nude maid service raising eyebrows in Lubbock, Texas. Entrepreneur insists her employees don't do anything but clean, but police keep close tabs. And number four, man with plunger tries to rob New York Bank. Police say a 49-year-old man tried to rob a bank in New York with a toilet plunger. How stupid do you got to be? Because there's one in every crowd. And, uh, and they, they butt-dialed the phone and hatched a plan? Well, it was in Did his pocket. Did you write that? No. <laughs> no, I didn't like that. I've heard of people doing that, though. I don't they, mean that. I mean, the text said they butt-dialed and hatched a plan. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the, phone was probably, the phone was probably in his back pocket. And he yes, Larry, we know how to, to, to butt-dial. You're, you're missing the joke. You know. I just want to know what hotel this is in, in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah, Holly, what do you think about that one? I think I think that whoever hatched this plan may not have lived in Lubbock, Texas very long, <laughs> because being from Texas myself, I can tell you there are many areas of the country that I have lived where this would be a wildly successful plan. Texas, unless you're in Austin, is not one of them. They are not they are not cool and open and out with it like that. They are very keep your sex under wraps. Don't talk Texas about it. Texas considered the Bible Belt. Yeah, it yeah, is. Huh? Have, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. We're, we are. Yeah, I is. think if if the if the South is the Bible Belt, Texas is the buckle. I mean, oh, we are okay. as Bible Belt as you get. Oh, because I I think of Kansas being the Bible Belt. Oh no, sir! You've obviously never been to Texas, then. <laughs> well, I've been through it twice, but other than being through it through twice, it twice. No. So you're still going through it. That's a long ride, <laughs> yeah. man. Indeed. No, the thing the thing about about hotels is it's very rare that you actually see the maid service. So what you know, I, I've said hotels where I'm leaving, they're in a hotel, and you come back and your room's made up. I mean, you know, who's gonna wait for the, who's gonna wait for these people? Obviously, Fred, it's a very uh, special service. Yes. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, what do you mean, who's gonna wait for these people? <laughs> this is like a paid-for service. These are the people who order it are gonna wait for it. Mm -hmm. People who. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm, I'm not paying for that. 
well, that see, that's my whole thing. I don't understand when you can get it for free. That, I mean, you know, maybe it's people who can't get it for free. Maybe that's the right answer. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't understand I don't strip clubs either, but I bet you guys could probably illuminate that for me as well. I, I same know. same thing. I think that's a waste of money too, uh, especially in this day and age with the internet. Anything? No, I mean, come on. I mean, anything you're, you're going to see at a strip club, you're going to see on the internet, and uh, you don't have to bring a pocket full of dollar bills with you. Well, my thing is, too, like, why would you pay anyone to tease you? Like, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. You're not getting anything. Well, that happens you're, at you're home. You're just looking. You're just at homes anyway. Yeah. And let me add to this also. A lot of better hotels have what's known as a churn-down service, uh -huh. where the maids come in and they turn the bed down and get, you, get the bed prepared for you to... Yeah. Go to bed at night, and that's probably where they utilize that very easily. I guess. Uh, turn down service. Yeah, okay. Turn something down. Ugh. So what I lobster? Stay in a nice hotels, I man. I'm not paying for turn down service. I do my own damn bed. <laughs> what lobster tail are we missing here? What didn't we touch on? Oh, the plunger to rob a bank. I wonder if that guy still gets charged with it with attempt on robbery, though. I mean, is that considered a weapon? I guess it could be, even if you're just using a, a wooden stick. It's a weapon, right? Well, he attempted to rob a bank. Yeah. Yeah, but it wouldn't be it, attempted robbery and attempted armed robbery, two different charges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's an interesting question because then you would say, like, anytime someone comes into a bathroom with a plunger, they're arriving armed and dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Th that'll uh, be the next item on the no fly armed. list. A plunger. Yeah, no plungers, right. <laughs> but the one I like is, they, they, and I don't see what they have to do about registration, but a 20 year old guy impersonates a cop by pulling people over. Why would you do that in the first place? There's so much stuff, especially nowadays, where people know what they're doing, and I mean, people aren't pulling over now for the police. They can pull over this Yahoo. I don't know. Maybe, well, yeah, maybe he's hoping to get a bribe. Well, you do see that a lot in areas where there are volunteer firefighters and ambulance corps people, like mm -hmm. in the say, just for instance, in, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey area, where you have a lot of volunteers, and the volunteers are able to have blue lights on their dashboard or in the on the roof, uh, blue signifying ambulance or fire in those states, unlike in others where it signifies police. But still, they ride around with these blue lights on their car. Some less than honorable types will attempt to pull people over with those blue lights. Yeah, you got to remember so, those are actually only courtesy lights anyway. Yes, in those states, exactly, because that's what blue means there. But it, it could be somebody from Massachusetts visiting New Jersey or Pennsylvania. They see a blue light behind them, they're going to pull over, because in Massachusetts, that's for police. So I can, can understand where it could be a problem. Well, and can we talk about the fact that the guy decided after he ran from the police to pull over at a bar? They called him <laughs> yeah, like, right. like, I'm going to go to the bar, and then... <sighs> Hopefully, yeah, hopefully I'll be he, safe there. They at least buy somebody a drink? Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. the cops. Maybe that was his hope. <laughs> He's like, guys, guys, just let me go. I'll buy you a round. Oh. I mean, as far as, as far as the number two, though, the, uh, the beeping sound, you hear that quite frequently on hospital. Like Larry said, you know, when things are being recorded. You have to be noticed. notified that you're being recorded. Right, exactly. that's to notify because they have to they have to inform you in some way, shape, face, shape, or form that this uh, call is being recorded right. for training purposes. Yeah, you know, it, is it, that why you're recording this call? call? Yes, for training purposes. <laughs> for training purposes and, and and for customer service and for training purposes, so we can prove that you yelled at us later on down the road. I've I've heard beeping for years on my phone. My phone's been tapped for years. I have, you know I, I I worked for NASA. I got an FBI file. So I, what? I think you the know? I think the beeping's in your head, not on your phone. <laughs> Beeping is in my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess that just about wraps up Lobster Tales for this hey, week. Except I have yeah? one quick comment oh, about the guy that tried to rob the bank with a toilet plunger. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say he had a case of irritable bank syndrome. Oh. <sighs> oh. Uh, luckily, luckily, this, luckily this show is edited and not live. <laughs> Flush that one. <laughs> Well, it's another exciting adventure of Lobster Tales. Thank you, Larry the Lobster. I couldn't <laughs> resist. I'm sure you couldn't. Who's going to start off our big topics this week? I'll start one off today. In Los Angeles last week, a group of Los Angeles County Animal Control Officers were heralding the loyalty of a black Labrador retriever that braved traffic to stay by another dog that was fatally struck by a car. On La Puente Street Wednesday morning, motorists put down traffic cones and shot video with the dogs. A video released Saturday showed the female Labrador lying next to a motionless yellow lab as vehicles passed near them. And I saw this video, 
I think it's great. I mean, the dog got hit. It was her friend, and she stayed by him until animal control got there. Unfortunately, the uh, the golden died. The black lab had to be taken by the animal control back to the owners. But I just think that no one's come forward to clear to claim her so far. So I'm hoping that the uh, that the owners come out and they take they took her to a shelter looking for the owners. And you know, I just hope they find this dog a, hound, a home. But you know, I thought it was a cute story, so I figured I'd let everybody know about it. Actually, Fred, I found a. Um follow up on this story and actually Maggie is going home with her owners because they were originally calling her Grace uh, like Amazing Grace but the owners actually uh, her name is Maggie and they did the uh, spaying and also the chip for nothing but they have to pay for the other charges for that dog as a matter of fact Maggie's a two year old and it's the family's only dog, and the family also includes children. So they do have the dog back in their possession, according to this. Good. What's the story with the other one, do they know? Did the they run, a, run away the or something? Got hit by the car. No, they don't say how the dog, you know, how the dog ended there. They don't know who the dog belongs to or anything. But, you know, Labradors are a very loyal dog in general. We used to have a Labrador, and that dog was very loyal very loving, uh, very easy to get along with. When Julie was a baby, Julie would climb on top of this dog and pull its ears and its tail <laughs> and lay on his back and go, ah, more, more. You know, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of dog they are. They're a great dog to have. It, this story just made me want to cry. I just saw that the video, like I just saw the, the entering like shot photo of the video. And I yeah. just couldn't, I just, I just, I just teared up because that just is the sweetest thing. And I, I can't the watch dog, things like you know, that. Just, yeah. I don't think would be able to handle it. Go ahead. Sorry, Ed. No, I said I can't watch things like that. Aww. Let's let's move on to something we can get angry about. Fred, tell us about the Scranton tax hike or something. Or, or maybe let's the, talk uh, about something else in Rage. Yeah, the, the city father, the town council, or whatever you want to call the idiots over in Scranton, uh, introduced a proposal to charge a 15% tax on private and non profit organized parking facilities where patrons pay to park and a dollar per space annual licensing fee that they say will be expected to generate five hundred thousand dollars a year for the city and i think it's outrageous personally 15 percent is a lot of money it's a lot of money 15 I mean, percent per it's 15 i mean you look at sales state. tax the average sales tax is seven eight cents on a dollar oh, seven or eight percent still six. you know so yeah day. but i mean you know so Seven cents is the average sales tax, and we're talking more than double that. Well, the thing is that there's no sales tax on parking. So what Scranton should have done, if they had been smart, would say, okay, there's made no it sales part tax. of the sales tax Ma collection, or or or, or, or make it okay. Sales tax in Pennsylvania is six percent. We'll make it six percent. Right. And this way, you're paying a, an equivalent of sales tax. Right. To me, it's outrageous. I understand what they're trying to do, but you have churches that charge not that charge for parking. You have parking lots out there i mean 15 because this is for non as well you said right anybody yeah. that wants to offer a parking space for a fee they have to pay this tax well patrons pay to park this is just within the, within the city of scranton they're also talking later on there was a follow-up on this they're talking about trying to do that at scranton wilkesbury international airport as well which is crazy because the airport pays a lot in taxes. They're, they're, the airport doesn't want to have anything to do with that. But the parking authority, which owns and operates five park facilities, would be exempt <laughs> from the course. imposing 15% tax. Like, there's a big surprise to anybody. Larry, you were going to say something? I was just going to say, what's next? You pay real, I mean, if you're a homeowner, you pay a real estate tax for the property you own. What are they going to start charging next? If you rent an apartment, are they going to start charging a tax on that too? Why not? They charge us. Well, you know, here in California, I just found out a couple of days ago that they're trying to lower the taxes on gasoline here in California because we have the highest prices for gas. And I found what's that your, right what's now. What's your average right now? Yeah, well, the average is like 430, 435, somewhere around there. Is it just you know what it is in Northern California? Yeah, what's it's that? about there. It's about, it's, it's about the over $4. Mm. It's over $4. dollars over $4. But what's interesting is 69% of that is taxes. Sure. And they're trying well, to lower that like down. Yeah. And you have to understand, even in Pennsylvania, I don't know what California, I don't know what Pennsylvania pays, we pay 31.1 cents a gallon just for state tax on, on gasoline, mm -hmm. and the federal excise tax all over the country is 18.9. So you drive into a Pennsylvania gas station before you even pump your first gallon, you're paying 50 cents a gallon. 
Yeah. That's outrageous. And I know Cal there are some states where it's 16, and it's not the same in every state. And I mean, California also has a problem with they got special blends of gasoline, which makes it more expensive to produce. Still, I mean, you need to lower the gas prices. People simply can't afford to drive anymore. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Another state heard from. What does St. Louis have to say about this? Well, I mean, here we're at about, I think, three ninety nine, so we're still below the $4 mark. That's right around where Boston is right now. Well, and, and some of the taxes here are, are terrible, but they tax, they tax much more important things. They should tax gasoline here, actually. It would be much more fair than a lot of the stuff they tax for, and maybe they'd be able to provide better health care. Moving here from Massachusetts was a huge shock as far as what the state will pay for and the kind of loopholes they leave open for all kinds of stuff. So, you know, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. But, I mean, as long as we're talking about outrage and things that our taxes pay for, are you guys ready for our big story today? Ready Everybody? as ever. Go let's ahead. Go. Ooh, so let's, I guess let's go to our West Coast correspondence here. Jessica, I know you brought us an update on uh, the UC Davis pepper spray incident and some of the stuff that's happened since then. And uh, I guess let's get to talking about that and maybe see what some of the thoughts are on it. I'm in Berkeley. I'm very, very close to UC Berkeley. But today, I think uh, the focus is on UC Davis, which is not too far away from where I live. And it's been about six months or so. It was last November when the UC Davis pepper spraying incident occurred. I know you guys probably remember there's a lot of yep, pretty, we talked pretty about bad it here videos. On this show, yeah. Yep, there's some videos and some some crazy photos of uh, officers on the campus spraying the students directly in the face. Well, it's back in the news. It's been six months now. You would think it's old news, but it's back. And the reason it's back is because it has taken six months for the campus to appoint a task force. They appointed a 12-person a task force uh, to get together and uh, generate uh, a report based on a full investigation that they did on this whole incident. What went wrong? What could have been done better? You know, who's pretty much, who's, who's to blame? They hired a consultant to come in and help them and everything. So they just released this report, and it's bad. It is bad. Uh, if, you, if you're able to, I mean, it's online. It, the whole 190-page report is available online if you want to comb through it and read it yourself. Oh, that's not bad. I thought you were going to say 720 pages. <laughs> no, no, it's only 190 pages only. So <laughs> in your spare time, you can check that out. Small uh, but the me <laughs> we have spare <laughs> time? <laughs> Um, but the media is doing a pretty good job at summarizing what's in that report for us. And what's in the um, report? What, Ed? What's in the report? What was the bottom line of their findings? Uh, in, a, in a sentence or a paragraph? In a, in a sentence, total administrative breakdown and incompetence. And their point? Um, well, that, that, and, and to quote the report, the incident should and could have been prevented. Uh, so so, so they're, they're blaming what level or what department? The campus police department or the campus police chief or the officers or the students whole, or who? The whole administration all okay. the way up to the chancellor herself. Okay. It was, it's a woman, a chancellor. Mm -hmm. So the whole leadership team, uh, there's a quote, I'm reading a quote from an article uh, in the Huffington Post written actually by a professor at UC Davis who's also a journalist. And he quotes, the actions of the leadership team provide a case study in how not to make important institutional decisions. Mm. Ouch. Well, Jess, I think a lot of the reason that they're actually calling this a total breakdown and that everyone's so enraged is one of the things this report showed was there was never a danger at all to the police. That It was like the most peaceful quiet, mm -hmm. sit down. I mean, I kept reading different levels of reports saying like there yep. was no movement. They were sitting down. They were covering yep. their heads. Just I think that was the reason why they really were appalled is they sort of figured out that at every level people knew what was happening. And at every level, somebody didn't take action to make the right thing happen. You're absolutely right, Holly. These were I mean, that's the bottom line. These students were peaceful protesters. Uh, the defense of the police chief, uh, also a, a woman, she uh, has resigned. She's no longer the, the police chief uh, as of a couple of days ago, very recently. Uh, so they've got an interim police chief in there now, but they're going to be looking for somebody, I guess, long term. Um, but she resigned because of the attacks that were made at her because she, her, in her defense, she said that 
you know, going back to this, and we've we've talked about this on on a number of base net programs uh, around the time that it happened. But just to summarize, the the defense that the police chief had was she thought that most of the people on the campus occupying were not students, so she felt that they posed a grave danger to her students. So that's why she acted. But pepper spraying is not is not the way you break up lawful peace peaceful um protesters yeah but look in the old days when we they used to have protest they mm-hmm. didn't even have pepper spray they ended up using batons and just different things like that people what's that they just went in and whacked the protesters exactly yeah 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 and part part of it is that fact that what the police did we all admit was wrong but when you go and you go and you move a protester and they come back and they, it gets to the point where, you know, you have to sit there and tell them, look, go, 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 just get out. And, and as long as they leave, there's no problem. The problem is you get the confrontations when the police tell the people to leave and they refuse to leave. And I've seen this happen a lot. I worked at the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant back in the 1980s, back in the 1980s when the Abalone Alliance uh, did a strike on it. And they did the right, the right way. They got in. They got in. They were moved out of the way. They put them on a bus. They took them to jail. They booked them. The kids were back, but they never created a problem, never created a threat. They were peaceful protesters and left. But what happens when you're mm-hmm. in, when you're, when you don't, when you're taking over, you have to make sure that when you take over a campus, you want to protest. You don't block doorways. You don't create a danger to other people. You sit on a, on a sidewalk and pro, but you make sure the pathways are clear. Because their right to protest does not infringe, should not infringe on my right to access that building peacefully without being bothered either. Yeah, well, and, and, and you say Davis, it didn't. The police were absolutely wrong with what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And and the big thing is is that they, you know, another part of the the administrative breakdown that's sort of like the the article I'm reading is is titled uh, is actually kind of funny. It's called Clown Show at UC Davis. Too bad it's not funny. And they just keep listing all these different things that you you want to just smack your forehead and you and shake your head and think, oh my god, what? So they apparently it's noted that they never considered any alternative plan to sending uh, police in to tear down the tents and and approach these uh, pro- peaceful protesters. That was it. That was their their uh, first. Their thank first God. Th- thank God. However, it was pepper first spray. Resort. It was simply cayenne pepper and water. It's, it wasn't anything really harmful that, was, that, that, exactly. that these kids were hit with. I mean, even tear gas. The actual tear gas from mace is actually a lot more invasive than that is. But it's still the idea of, of the assault on the students by police officers that were not threatened. That bothers me. Well, I also think the big the big issue in the case too is that you know this apparently this woman was told well in advance that she had absolutely no right to do something like this that the uh-huh. university is public property and that yep. it hasn't it doesn't have a curfew and so students are allowed to be wherever they want on campus at any time of the day as long as they're not hurting anybody doing whatever they want to do you know regardless of if it's disruptive it's if it's not dangerous therefore she had no she had no uh, precedence over it and that's the that that's sort of the beginning of the problem is that basically she didn't really have a right to do anything pepper yeah. spray no pepper spray she was not she, supposed what, to what about the non what about non students however do they it, fall in the same in the same course of students unfortunately the university is on public property it's public property, public property. It's public it's a state property. college yeah. Public so property, property. Which, which means it's owned by the people of the state of California, and the people of the state of California do have the do have the right to say if you're not a student, you have no business being there. And I'm not. I'm just. I'm taking devil's advocate. I agree with what you're saying. I just want to. You know, make well, sure I, I guess, but sides. they don't. Yeah, they know, Yeah, they can't. It, it's public property, yeah. so anybody from the anybody in public. However, means, they do have a, they do have a right to, to to close certain parts of the campus after dark for safety reasons and things like that. I mean that that. Well, the, they don't have. Do but the but the point is, the university does not have a curfew and and did not did that that they didn't have a curfew. It's, the it's not closed. Yeah. In a democratic society, we follow laws, and there was no law for this. Right. There was no law whatsoever. Um, in fact, the pepper spray wasn't even something they were legally – wasn't even a, an approved weapon for the UC Davis police. They oh, hadn't well, even been trained spray, to use, spray, to use the pepper spray. Pepper spray is not a weapon. <laughs> pepper well, spray is not a weapon. Well, that opens it, a whole new can of worms than if they weren't even authorized to carry it. That's Correct. Different. That's that's the point. Is in this case, it actually was off. It, it actually was called a weapon, and they were not authorized to use it. And that was the law that was in place. Yeah. Is anybody getting punished for this at all? Yeah, other than uh, the chief of police losing her job. 
she she resigned. Okay. But she's been on administrative. She's been on a paid administrative leave. Leave. Oh yeah. By the way, where can I get that job? Yeah, she was on paid administrative leave. The chancellor was put on uh, put on paid administrative leave as well, and so was the lieutenant who who mm. actually did the uh, was caught in the photo doing the actual pepper spraying. So other the, than the, the chief pepper. resigning, nobody lost the job over this. Nope. Wow. Not yet, anyway. Not <laughs> yet, anyway, right? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to cut it off. I don't know if you have more to say on the subject, Jess, but maybe you want to try to stay on top of this, and if there's any way we could even talk to somebody in the school system, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think that would be pretty neat to try to talk to somebody who was maybe there, a student or something like that. So we'll keep an eye out for that. And, uh, and Jess, do you have any, any other news on this you want to share with us this week, or should we bump on? I think that's a pretty good wrap-up there, yeah. Should we plunge into the next subject? Oh, let's. let's <laughs> oh, we can't get rid of this plunger today, can we? <laughs> I didn't Sorry, say it. Look at what you started, Larry. Yeah, exactly, Larry. It's all your yeah, fault. But, yeah, but when Fred said that, I didn't. I had nothing to do with that. At least we're not hatching any news stories. Yeah, exactly. Oh, gracious. Well, moving, moving. Yeah, you're definitely not at this one because this lady, it, no one could say she was born yesterday. Apparently a 73-year-old grandma. And we actually are a week behind on this story, which shocks me because this is so up our alley. Her name was Darlene Mays, and she was selling pot and illegal guns in Oklahoma. Of in all Oklahoma? places. Oklahoma? <laughs> Oklahoma, correct. One of the places you would not so much it's right think. Right down the street from Texas, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where I grew up in Texas, it was really close because we were near, uh, you know, the the border there. So that that eastern border. So that's uh, yeah, marijuana, guns. She uh, she was uh, apparently shut. You know, they have like they had a law and order on this a while back, and everybody said it was like a big joke. But apparently, this lady was caught by the police with the things in her uh, possession. So pretty shocking. Does that sound like uh, you guys have any grandmas that smuggle pot and uh, guns and cash? Haven't heard about know, that in Boston recently. I don't know. I don't know, but she she better watch out for the ninjas. We have we have ninjas here in in uh, Northern California. Ninjas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Ninjas. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's a true, it's a true story. There's a lot of uh, delivery services popping up in in the dispensary medical marijuana community because a lot of the dispensaries are being closed down mm-hmm. for for a lot of obvious reasons that right. we won't go into, but. There has has been a number, I think it's happened twice now, where a delivery, I mean, you think about it, these delivery folks are out in a vehicle that they are carrying around tons of pot mm-hmm. and tons of cash, and they got jack, jacked by, carjacked by people in ninja costumes. Oh, <laughs> oh you give up your pot, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So grandma better watch out for the ninjas. You know yeah. that sounds exactly like the kind of uh, the kind of operation a bunch of potheads would set up to get themselves some pot. I mean, the fun part about it, that they that the reports is they believe that she supplied about forty percent of the pot circulating in the vicinity, which yes. is also parts of Arkansas, Kansas, and Missouri. Yeah, she was the kingpin. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, all the way to Missouri. So you know, who knows if anybody from my school wasn't selling dime bags. She was selling pounds, man. Oh, you know, the be- oh, did you did you read also, Fred, that when they you know when they said you know what are you going to do with all this money? You're a drug kingpin. She's like, it's for my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, look out for the movie in Hollywood, California. Yeah, here comes a movie. Here comes a movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Drug smelling gra- selling grandma on 3D sense around. Starring Betty White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Betty, Betty, yeah. Well, Betty White. Uh, Betty White is Darlene Myers. <laughs> oh gosh. She'll make a book. Oh, that would just be genius. <laughs> oh god, yeah. Here we go. You know, there's a story. There's a there's a story in this one. Oh, for sure. Well, uh, I, I guess the uh, the really big story this week is obviously the Discovery making its last flight. And this one, it actually got to piggyback on a plane all the way into Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Piggybacking the uh, shuttle on board a uh, 747, custom made, of course, is actually is actually pretty standard. Because when, when it lands at the Kennedy Space Center or Edwards, it has to be taken across country on the back of a – it right. can't fly on its own. It's like – remember, it's like a glider. Has no means of transportation from the ground, so it the it coming in on the 747 is standard procedure, and the plane has been used for most of the shuttles out there. But it's a, it's an awesome sight to see. 
Well, it is a pretty awesome sight to see from what I understand. I actually, uh, I sent you guys the Washington Times article. My sister and my niece actually got to be on the runway, next to the runway, and watch it come in. And there's this fabulous photo of my niece with, like, her hair blowing in the breeze. And I just think it's really cool that a member of my family got to be there for that. Also, just really cool to see your family in the news. (laughs) As long as they're not a a 73-year-old grandma (laughs) smuggling pot. Yep, and one of the other shuttles, the original shuttle, the Enterprise, the one that was never made to go into space, it was just the initial test flight one, landed on, or is going to land on the uh, Intrepid on the Hudson River in New York. So that'll be going on permanent display there. I'm not sure which one it is, but we're also getting a a shuttle out here in California. You're getting the Um, only one that's left, it's called Discovery. That's the one, yeah, exactly. So there's and, a discovery that's staying in D.C., and then there's, no, there's also a discovery there's that's discovery. in L.A.? No, there's only one discovery. There's, uh, there's, there's only three shuttles left. Or is it, or is it Atlantis that's uh, going to Because I was going to say the discovery is the one Atlantis. that's in D.C. Yeah. from. You got to remember, the shuttle, again, was, it was a unique vehicle. I mean, started out being two seats. And they wanted having as many as eight people flying in that thing. It's a reusable spacecraft that nobody else in the world has done since. And I, I always thought it was a great idea. And like Ed knows, I worked at the Kennedy Space Center years ago. And I got, about, I got to be about 35 feet away from the shuttle. It's an awesome sight being up on uh, Launchpad 30, uh, 29B. So it's a beautiful thing. Oh, it's the so, Endeavor that's coming to California. The Endeavor, okay. Or the Endeavor. Okay, yeah, thank you. One of them. There we go. Yeah, so I guess we'll have right, one. Discovery so blew up. Duh. <laughs> No, it didn't. That was a challenge. No, challenger, was a challenger, challenger, and a Columbia. Challenger. Right. That's right. Yeah, the Discovery is the one that's in DC. Yes, sure. and the Enterprise, which doesn't really count because that never went to space. That was just the experimental one. But that's going to the Intrepid that's in New York. The Air Space Museum. Yeah. Which is something nice to see too. Very cool. Nice. Well, okay, so I guess now, uh, you know, speaking of areas of expertise for Fred, apparently the, the Coast Guard stopped some drugs running this uh, in a submarine. Is that right, Fred? People are trying to use homemade or man-made uh, homemade submarines to try and avoid, the, of course, the radar and sonar. They got, basically, they got caught. Now, people have to remember that the Coast Guard is the smallest of the services, so they use the assistance of the other services out there, but they caught them, got them, sank it. And what a waste of good, 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 good pot. They should have called Granny. She could have probably got a sold it for him. And where did this happen? It looks like one of them they found in Pescagoula, Mississippi, with a boat. Uh, and then there was one found in Key West. So I guess the multiple locations, actually. It looks like Key West was... And these things are cheap to build, you said? That's what they said. They said they're really cheap to build. That's the crazy part. They well, said... Basically- that- it's what wood, wood, wood and a motor. I mean, it, and yeah. you just have to make sure it's sealed and goes underwater. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, they said they're so crude and cramped inside that, mm-hmm. you know, that they're just, you'd have to basically hold a gun to a guy's head to even get him into one because they're just so, like you said, basically, Fred, just, you know, like a wooden room sealed for, sealed to go underwater. You have to remember what they're also doing things like, you know, they're trying to hide drugs everywhere. They're doing the smuggling. They're trying to hide drugs everywhere they can. And when, when I was in the, in the Coast Guard, we had a, a, several incidents where they were hiding. They're trying to keep the drugs away from the smell, the, basically from the dogs. And they'll wrap the drugs in cellophane, paper towel. They'll, wrap, they'll even put it in a fresh water supply, hoping the dog can't smell the water. So the idea of a submarine doesn't, doesn't really surprise me. They're even using high-powered... Uh, Boats called cigarette boats, and you know they'll do 70, 80 miles an hour on the harbor. They're trying, you know, they're they're, tr- they're doing anything they can to get it going, and that the Coast Guard been trying to stop for years. And when they catch them, it's it's very severe, and it's just something that people have to understand. It this is a war that, that they've been fighting for 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 decades. Well, you know, that's what the really unfortunate thing was people said about the Secret Service fiasco this week was just that that basically Obama went down there to talk to the leaders of some of the South American countries about how to minimize this, how to how to actually start stopping this war on drugs from both sides and how to actually put the kibosh on it working together with other countries. And of course, instead of learning anything about what happened at these talks, all we've heard about is that there were some Secret Service agents who did something illegal. You know, like this is clearly a big problem. It keeps cropping up. 
But instead of discussing the real problem at hand, you know, most of the news networks are just covering what happened with the Secret Service. And while we're talking about the Secret Service, I need to put in a plug for this week's Viewpoint episode. That's show number 12 of Viewpoint. That was Tony Mazzucco's major topic on the show this week was the Secret Service debacle. So if anybody's interested in hearing more details on this conversation, listen to show 12 of Viewpoint with Tony Mazzucco and yours truly. We dove into that topic amongst others. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are covering it because, you know, I've been reading just a little bit of sort of what the Colombian, obviously the Colombian government is involved in this, and this is a submarine that came from Colombia. I mean, this is obviously still an ongoing problem, and, you know, Obama does not feel like legalizing drugs is the right answer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not trying to find the right answer with, with these other countries, and I'll be really curious to find what comes of this. The, the problem is that there's so there's so much money to be made in this industry that people are willing to take the risk because remember they they've caught about the Coast Guard says it caught it this is the 30th uh, ant a semi it's called a semi submersible in less than six years they, that they've gotten there's if they've caught 30 of them how many have they not caught they're cheap to make they transport you can get them from one side to the other underwater and so the war is also a financial war because. It starts out as poppies growing in Southeast Asia. It's processed, or even in Colombia, it gets processed all through the world. We want to put cocaine on the streets. We want to put heroin on the streets. That's making somebody millions and millions and millions of dollars until the, the money flow stops. It's going to continue. It's the old theory about making marijuana legal, for instance. Instead of just having it as a black market product, legalize it and at least let the government tax it. And just like a $10 pack of cigarettes is $7 worth of taxes. So just tax the crap out of it then and make it legal. And well, you know, at least help pay down the government's debt. Well, it's true that a lot of, I mean, that's how the, uh, a good portion of Americans are starting to feel. Obviously, there are others who still are just seriously, you know, they're very, very opposed to it. But a part of the problem with what Fred said, you know, is stopping with this being such a big money industry. One of the reasons why these other countries are wanting to talk to the American government is because right now we're the biggest consumers in the world of this stuff. They estimate that on the something like I think forty percent of all the money that comes to these people comes from the U.S. and that's pretty. That's that's why we have to be involved in the solution because most of this money that's being made from this is coming from us. That's, that's amazing. Right. It, it's amazing. I wonder where these people are though. But as far as I know, I don't personally know anybody that uses heroin or anything. I, I, I'm in agreement that it's such a, a big problem here. But yet, out of all of the people I know, I don't know anybody that uses it. So where are these people? Well, if you knew they were using it, chances are other people would know too, and then they'd be in jail. I think the whole point is if you're yeah. going to be successful. Do it on the low key. Exactly. Part of, the, and part of the problem with legalizing pot is where does it stop? You don't just stop at pot. Well, then they want this, they want to do that. And there are people that want it all legalized, and some people don't want any of it legalized. And it, it, it creates a whole big legal issue I really don't think we want to get into. So... No, actually, this it's, it's ironic that we're talking about all of this now because we also <laughs> talked about this on last week's Viewpoint, number 12. We also discussed cigarettes, the legality or the, the differences between alcoholism and cigarette smoking and taxing of cigarettes or taxing of alcohol. I'll, I'll tell you, it's, we really can't go into the details here because we just already covered it this week. I just find it ironic that we're, this whole panel here happens to bringing up the same subjects. So I'm glad that we did bring it up, though, and at least instead of rehashing it, we could just have our viewers go and listen to Viewpoint Show 12. It was covered in detail, quite ironic. Well, Ned, while we're talking about Viewpoint, is it, doesn't Mr. Prince do the music for Viewpoint as well, speaking of things that cross over between shows? He's having no, a big week. No, he doesn't. He just does it for our flagship show, After Dark, which we're going to be bringing back. The theme song is called, ironically enough, After Dark by Peter Prince of New Jersey. There are several Peter Princes if you search, but he's Peter Prince in New Jersey and easy enough to find if you Google him that way or search for him that way. Yes, he did the um, theme After Dark, which was the theme song for As We See It for at least the past year, but we are going to be bringing back 
our show After Dark shortly. So we have a new theme song for the past two weeks of for As We See It, and Peter's song will be going back to After Dark. But yes, thank you very much for Peter, and he could certainly use the fans out there. Uh, go check out his work. He's done some amazing things over the years. He's got a long career in the industry as a composer. He's not a singer himself. He is a musician, but he's not a singer. He's primarily a composer. He composed a song for the New York Mets that was actually played at the Old Shea Stadium, the anniversary of the 1969 World Series. So it was back in 2009 it was used uh, for the anniversary of the 69 World Series. They played it at Shea. And then he also did a song called The Ultimate Sacrifice, which is a tribute song for Marianne Kalura, Fairlawn, New Jersey police officer that was killed in the line of duty. And I have to throw in a disclaimer since we're on her topic. Peter Prince is the music coordinator for BassNet Intermedia Group, our parent company. Marianne Kalura has a tie to, and that song has a tie to BassNet because we own the rights to a film project with the working title of Taking It As It Comes, which is a documentary about Marianne Kalura. So hopefully someday in the future, through BassNet, you'll be able to see a documentary about Marianne. I just went on to Amazon and repurchased that the Mets song Miracle Drive on Amazon. It's available okay, so how Amazon did you find well. it? What's what's the link or whatever? How easy was it to find? Very easy. Go in, go in, do your Amazon search for Peter Prince. The name of the album is Inspired. You go on, it's inspired. You go to the Inspired link. The song is like number thirteen. Click on it, download for ninety nine cents, and have yourself a song. And those of you who are Mets fans are gonna love it. There you go. And I know. Um, the Ultimate Sacrifice is also there. So go yeah, to yeah, Amazon.com and look for Peter Prince. So, Gene, you wanted to say something uh, about one of Peter's other songs? Yeah, the song called Softly Down that he wrote ah, in memory yes. of uh, Captain Sully. That, right, uh, The Miracle on, on the Hudson. The Hudson. Yeah. 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 Great There's song. another one. So there yeah. you go, guys. So look for Peter's work on Amazon. So moving from stuff that everybody cares about to stuff that at least one person on this panel doesn't care about, let's get into our Say It For Me, Fred. Who cares? Thank yes. you. There we go. Boy, I'm pulling teeth to get him to say a signature well, it's, 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 This panel is getting less and less people that care because we just found out that Jessica doesn't really care either. Yeah, well, what's yeah. it? What, what, three for two now? Yeah, I guess so. Well, you know what? That's okay because Gene, Sorry, Holly. <laughs> that's okay. You, you know, Gene and I don't mind. We'll cover the stuff that the rest of America cares about. We're not making you love Dancing with the Stars. It's an acquired taste. That's, that's right. Say. That's okay. right. Like a so fine is eating, So is eating snails, and I don't do those either. And you're not making me hate it any less either, though. <laughs> hey, I can't. I can't believe that's the case. Well, there was an exhaustive article in the Washington Post about uh, Gavin getting kicked off this weekend. I know I told you guys this before, but Gavin and I have sang together in our past uh, in New York, and I'm just really sad because I know he was enjoying the show. I know that it was a great experience, but kind of sad to see him go. He's a doofus, but I get sick of watching people who are super talented on Dancing with the Stars. I think sometimes you want to watch people who, for whom <laughs> dancing is not their first ability. No, we well, unfortunately, about that a it's, weeks like, back. it's like the weakest link. Yep, exactly. It was the weakest link, that's for sure. So, Gene, did you get a chance to watch the new format that they do where they have the dance-off? What's the new format? Yes, They're taking it off the air? No, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't you love that? But, they, uh, but they're doing a dance-off at the end of each show. I think American Idol did something similar at one point where essentially – they, they feel bad for the people who may not have the same fan base as other people. So they have them do a dance off at the end for the judges, whoever the two lowest people are on the voting scale, so that they can then have a chance to redeem themselves. You know, Holly, I think watching those two, those two dances, you know, Jaleel White and of course, Gavin, you got to look at them and see that Jaleel was clearly better prepared and clear, clearly a better dancer than Gavin was. Gene, you're not saying he practiced ahead of time, are you? I thought we discussed that a couple weeks ago, too. I'm pretty sure he did. 
Well, yeah, because we, we had a woman who on the show, apparently, Holly was saying a couple weeks ago, got accused of cheating because she took dance lessons. So, I mean, this again, it's a show about dancing. Why wouldn't, if you're a celebrity, why wouldn't you take dance lessons? You don't want to make yourself look like a total ass in front of 300 million people. Well, you know, Fred, they do prepare in case there is a dance-off for that final dance. That's a that, clear, that, uh, That's not what I'm talking about. Holly was saying a couple of weeks ago, a woman was accused of cheating because she went out and took dance lessons prior to the show. I think that's uh, fair. That was that absolutely was fair. That was yeah, I, I do too. Gene, didn't you uh, say that when you were on vacation, you saw the uh, show live? Yeah, the ver- the Las Vegas version. That's with the stars live from Las Vegas. Is that actually Pretty a competition show. as well, or just like a Broadway show? No, it's not a competition. It's okay. just a like a review type thing. A lot of dancing, a lot of uh, jokes, a lot of different things going on. And the whole cast was great. It was a great show. Do you so recommend it's sort of, it? It's, it's the ones that from previous seasons, right, Gene? Yeah, like Joey Fatone was there. Kyle Massey. Lacey Schwimmer was there. Just a whole bunch of different things going on. And the whole show is very well produced and also very entertaining. Oh, very good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I've got to say, cool. while, while it's not really my cup of tea, the Dancing with the Stars, I think that uh, I, the, one, the couple that I have seen, the couple episodes that I've enjoyed, have been the athletes. I think they're the best. You know, that's so funny because one of the guys said last week, oh, I'd really like to see some athletes on there. And I was like, dude, Jerry Rice. So, yeah. Yeah, like a lot. A, Mains, ton of tons of athletes have done the show. Heinz Ward after he won the Super Bowl. Yep, Heinz Ward, right, right. That that's the one. That's one of them that I watched a couple episodes with him in it. It was good. I love it because I feel like it totally takes them out of their element. Yep. Because I love Jr. Jr. was great. Oh, he was the best. Jr. is the he best. Was, yeah. yeah, he was great in Dallas. Who cares? Oh, you you did hear about Jr. and you said you did too, Fred, because he was oh, the know, rock veteran. So you always choose the weirdest times to say who cares. You always say it when it's. I, I don't like the show. I just, I like the idea behind. I like to see that if they're going to do the show the way that I like to see them do it with actual stars, actual celebrities, and a lot of people that don't dance and have to learn and have to show their basic inner talent from not you know and not necessarily be have maybe one professional dancer teamed up with a non-dancer uh, celebrity. And see how that works out. That'd be great too. That's sort of the idea behind the show. But after you get through a few seasons, you're going to run out of people who can't dance at all, and occasionally exactly. you're going to get one with some experience. So, That's but speaking right. of weird experience, can we talk about Jennifer Lawrence and Peta? You actually brought this story to me, Fred. I had no idea this had happened, and as we have talked about, I'm a pretty big Hunger Games fan. Um, but very much in character for Katniss, apparently in her first movie, Winter's Bone, Jennifer Lawrence uh, gutted a squirrel. And when asked about it for Rolling Stone, they said, was it fake or did you really do it? And she said, well, I should say it was fake for PETA, but screw PETA, which, of course, then has caused a big controversy in the media. PETA, I think, has actually been surprising for them, very mature about this. But they're saying, you know, she obviously said off the cuff, we think she'll probably do better with these things in the future. But the media has been covering it as if, as if though, you know, screw PETA were, was like something she shouted from a bandstand and then like threw blood on people. I mean, it, it's been a big, big scandal. I think this is about a couple of squirrels that she had. It, you know, she basically saying "eff it, it's a squirrel." I understand what what she means, and you know, I I don't agree with the sentiments of screw Peta. I think Peta, in my own opinion, goes overboard in a lot of what they do. But their basic idea behind the ethical treatment of animals is absolutely spot well, on. Somebody's got to protect the animals. Yeah, well, that's what we have the ASPCA for, and the armed uh, armed animal, animal cops in Manhattan. Jessica, what does liberal Northern California Silicon Valley think? <laughs> I think I think Peter's just one of the. I, I think in this instance, really, what what Jennifer Lawrence was saying was, oh, you know, s- screw the fact that I'm supposed to be politically you know, not, correct. Yeah, be politically correct. I think she isn't really taking a targeted hit at Peta. But that being said, you know, I think PETA is one of those things. I'm a huge, huge believer in the ethical treatment for animals, and I'm a Humane Society member and all that stuff, too. But sometimes PETA goes a little bit far. So they, they're, always the, they're always the butt of the joke, I think, sometimes. That's my problem with political correctness. I think just everybody and everything is just so worried about being politically correct these days. I like PETA. You know, people eating tasty animals. 
Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know, Fred, that's old just joke. wrong. Okay, man. PETA, you can address your comments to Fred Boaz at... <laughs> Yeah, right. I believe it's F. Boaz at Basenet. <laughs> yeah, the, the idea behind that, and that, joke, that joke comes from the idea that, of being poli po uh, politically correct because you can't, you know, everything that goes on out there with animals is not unethical. I mean, if this girl's holding a squirrel, it's not unethical, but it's But if she, she cut it, if she cut it apart. Right, yeah, which she, what she had to do my, for you know, There's certain things you don't do. I would no sooner beat a dog than jump off a building. Anybody who does should be taken to jail. You know what would be real hypocritical? Oh, at the oh. end of at the end of the movie or television show that supposedly that took place in, they better not have put up that disclaimer. No animals I was just going to say that earlier. Yeah, of this. exactly. I, I had better not watch that movie or TV show and then see that disclaimer at the end. That would be really hypocritical. No right. animals this were harmed in the making of this movie. Yeah. Well, right. just, just for reference for those people who do want to look it up, this was the movie Winter's Bone. It was nominated for an Oscar. And I think one of the reasons she may have said, you know, screw PETA, was she actually did have to learn how to do this. She had to learn how to clean a squirrel and she had to watch someone else do it. And she said when that process started, she, she couldn't take it. She got sick. She cried. She ran away. And I think a part of it was it was something that was very important to her character's character development, something that people who have to eat squirrels, people who have to hunt, people who are hungry, because then her, her other character well, was in sort people of... People eat squirrels just like they eat any other wild animals. So exactly. Sure. And it's sort of like you were saying for ethical treatment of animals hunting animals to eat them for nourishment is one of the things that people even PETA has has some people who feel that that's an appropriate use for them and so I think that was sort of a part of it is it's difficult in Hollywood because you're portraying something but you want to portray it realistically and I think sometimes that can walk the line of controversy and especially when somebody actually opens up and says something about it in an interview like this it just cracks the door wide open yeah, no, squirrel. You know, like I said, squirrels people eat. Now, I'm not a vegetarian. The day Peter knocks on my door complaining to me about the uh, hamburger that I ate over the cow that was killed, we're going to have a serious problem here. So, And that's part of the problem of what's happening. I mean, Peter, and I understand what they want and what they stand for, but people who in their name, they're not necessarily sanctioned by them, throwing blood on people who are wearing furs. I mean, that's a, going after people who are wearing leather shoes. I mean, that's, that's just insanity. It, it's like going after vegetarians for eating a poor, harmless vegetable. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. Well, I think, I think it is crazy, and I think moving into, speaking of, you know, animals dying, I guess humans could be considered animals, and this was a pretty big week in obits. So Dick Clark better known as Richard Wagstab Clark, was born November 30th, 1929, in Bronxville, New York. He was identified as the world's oldest teenager. Guy never aged, of course. His alma mater was Syracuse University, and, of course, he was a businessman, game show host, radio and television personality. And his years active were from uh, 1945 all the way to 2012 when he passed away. He had three wives, two children as well. He died on April 18th at the age of 82 of a heart attack, and he will be uh, very much missed because he was a great guy. He was, he, was very, he was an entrepreneur, very entertaining person, and had his hands at everything, game shows and music and everything like that. And American Bandstand, of course, was his biggest venture, introducing records to kids and kind of integrating blacks and whites together by bringing different groups into the bandstand environment for people to experience and get to know a little better through Dick Clark. I, I think that anyone in the country right now would echo that sentiment. And I think that New Year's Eve is just not going to be the same ever again. Our kids will never know. Oh, but, so you uh, cut that out. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that Bandstand actually started out in what is now w, uh, Channel 6 in Philadelphia. And it was there for a lot of years until Dick Clark took it and moved out to Los Angeles. And like Gene said, they mixed a lot of different types of music. It was a great time had by all, and unfortunately it went off the air. But people are talking about Dick Clark's death there as... He was, this man was a music icon, a music legend, was involved, like Gene said, in every aspect of music, from production 
to even performance. I remember that he did sing once and started laughing. It was great, and Dick Clark will be sorely missed. I agree. And speaking of music, I mean, I think most of our most of our obits this week actually come from the music world. Andrew Love of the Memphis Horns has died as well. And for those of you out there who may not be familiar with the Memphis Horns, you know, Fred was talking about people who have combined uh, black and white, you know, Motown and pop. And these two guys were the pinnacle of that. They were actually the musical equivalent of that. One black, one white, each played a horn. They were on Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness, Al Green's Let's Stay Together, Aretha Franklin's Think. And uh, he was the saxophone of the two. Andrew Love was the saxophone, and his partner was actually played the, the uh, Wayne Jackson actually played the trumpet. And the two of them were just pretty much the iconic sound. I mean, I have to say, Try a Little Tenderness is my favorite intro, one of my two favorite Motown intros of all time. And I think those two guys just really made the sound of the 60s and 70s. And they really worked all the way through, I would say, Jessica's in my lifetime, even on to stuff that has been recently released. So he will be sorely missed in music. Jumping into entertainment, it's ironic with early part of May, the Dark Shadows redo with Johnny Depp coming out. I can't wait. Uh, I really can't. I remember the kid coming home, watching the soap opera Dark Shadows with Barnabas Collins. Absolutely. I think it's great that they're actually going to make a movie out of it. Absolutely. And unfortunately, just two weeks ago, it was announced a week afterwards that we lost Jonathan Fred, Barnabas Collins, at 87. That's right. Of, of natural causes. He, you know, it wasn't released that he had any particular illness. He, uh, he was out right up until the end going to conventions and everything for the original Dark Shadow series. And he also had a cameo walk-on role in the Dark Shadows remake that's coming out next month. So cool. at 87, Barnabas is gone. And it's almost like he was waiting for it, you know? Yep, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I guess coming from the land of plenty this week with obituaries. <laughs> Not funny in the obit section, I know. Men at Work's Greg Ham also uh, deceased this week. Uh, Colin Hay has called him a beautiful man. Colin Hay was his partner in Men at Work and now a solo artist, very popular. And uh, that that band, I think, was basically the pride of Australia. So I know that there are many Aussies crying in their beers tonight. I have, have many, one. many memories from the 80s over them. They were a big favorite of mine in the early to mid 80s. Then also we have one more that we can talk about. Levon Helm, a drummer for the, the rock group, the uh, band, passed away. He was 71 years old. His drummer backed a pair of legendary musicians and then became himself with the band. He, all, he died of, cancer, of throat cancer in New York City at, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And music lovers, for those who made this life so filled with joy and celebration, they, I used to love the music of the band. Uh, they were originally known as the Hawks, and they became the band, and they were always the band. They did uh, Joe Walsh with them occasionally, played with Joe Walsh and the Eagles, played with the Beatles in some support roles. Man's going to be sorely missed, loved his music, and again, that's four gone. Let's hope we don't get anybody on this week. The band actually was one of the acts at the original Woodstock that Levon Helm was part of. And what's interesting is um, they only had two songs on the top 40 hits. One in 1969 that made it only to 25, and that was their big one up on Cripple Creek. And then in 72, they had a 34, number 34 position called Don't Do It. But the band was great. Levon Helm was great. We'll miss him. We'll miss, miss the group as well. You can still hear Cripple Creek every so often on the radio. That's how good this music was. It's a music. The band transcended time, as far as I'm concerned. I love that music. Yeah. I mean, Great. my generation, I think, thinks of the weight. I, that that song just carries, if you will, across all the ages. Mm hmm. Yeah, you're right. Well, so then I guess if nobody has anything else, that's just about going to wrap it up for show number 39 of As We See It from April 22nd, 2012. I want to remind everybody that between now and the first week of June, we have a special promotion going on. If you donate, contribute to BaseNet TV, go to BaseNetTV.com. 
That's BaseNetTV.com, our website where everything about BaseNet is available. And up on the top, in one of the tabs, you'll see a Donations tab. Click on that Donations tab, and you could help contribute and support BaseNet there for as little as a $1 donation. Now, the good news. As I said, between now and the first week of June, for all contributions that we receive, BaseNet is going to donate 20% to the Jimmy Fund at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute's Scooper Bowl the first week of June in City Hall Plaza in Boston. So a contribution to BaseNet will also automatically give a 20% donation to the Scooper Bowl, to the Jimmy Fund. Please do that at BaseNetTV.com. You can follow us on all so social media sites. We are now BaseNet TV on everything. So whether you're on Google+, Facebook, or Twitter, just look for BaseNet TV, follow us, follow our fan page, and you could stay tuned to all of our latest news and comments there. And with that, from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. And from the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. And from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. From the Bay Area in Northern California, I'm Jessica Moskowitz. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. And from Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And thank you so much for listening today. Just a brief reminder, if you want to hear some of the best songs ever recorded from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, tune in to GM, GMM Radio at GMMRadio.com. Thanks again for listening, folks. We'll see you next week on As We See It. Have a great day.